Hey, Sarah, welcome. Hey, Vicky. Thank you for inviting me to catch up with you. Always a joy. Uh, yeah, well, look, I love these Facebook Lives because it gives me a chance to talk with people that I really want to talk to. And of course, I always love our conversations. And before we delve deep into free work, and um, I want to talk a little bit about the Dog Behaviour Conference. For those of you out there, Sarah Fisher is one of our presenters at the Dog Behaviour Conference. If you have not registered yet, go ahead and do so. It is from 1st, April the 1st to the 3rd. It is virtual, so it's online, doesn't matter where in the world you are. And uh, if you sign up, you're going to hear the most incredible presentations. You go to dogbehaviorconference.com to sign up. But here we have Sarah Fisher, who is a canine educator and the founder of Animal Centered Education. Changed my life learning from her. She's also uh, one of our faculty at the Victoria Stillwell Academy. And every, every student who's ever heard you speak, I just like their minds go, Phew. what, like, why didn't we, why is it, or didn't we know, or why has it taken us so long to understand or that actually just by watching, by observing, you can get so much information about your dog. Could you tell us a little bit about ACE and also about free work for those of people who, who don't know what it is? With pleasure. Animal Centered Education or ACE, is, um, something that has been created from all the information that I've learned from the only dog experts that exist and that's the dogs themselves it's it's hard to kind of explain what it is but it really breaks down into observations where we really are learning to see our dogs possibly with new eyes ace free work modifications of many other techniques that are beneficial to the dogs in our care we also introduce like really mindful body contact. But I suppose the two most important things are the ACE observations and ACE free work. And free work is the evolution again of everything that I started to introduce to dogs that were really struggling in the human world. And most of those dogs were in shelters. So they were really touch sensitive. The whole world had been turned upside down. We were limited in space. We were sometimes limited where we could take those dogs to give them a break from kennels and actually couldn't give them a break from kennels just because of the size of the site. So teaching them to basically walk over different textures with their feet, touching maybe, you know, uh, empty bags of dog food and dog blankets. And we were getting the rubber matting out of the car footwells of everybody that was attending the courses for this one particular dog who was really distressed. By giving them that experience, and that comes from my human anatomy and physiology knowledge, these dogs started to just settle and to become more thoughtful in their movement instead of staying in this reflexive and reactive emotional state because they were overwhelmed. And there was one dog in particular who that experience quite pro probably saved his life and he lived till he was 15 and had a beautiful life on a farm in Devon. So all of those elements have been built on over 27 years, adding more sensory experiences where dogs were able to use their nose in the scent barns at the farm if they were coming to visit me, and then taking some of that information back into the shelters. So the way I was connecting with shelter dogs was expanding, created by dogs for dogs. That's a really long answer, isn't it, to your question? No. But it's so many things, and yet it's it's complex, but it's not. It's really simple. And I think what you just said, it's created by dogs for dogs, yep. and that dogs are the best teachers. And for, for so long, we have this, this, not just even the adversarial training relationship that unfortunately still carries on but even sort of in the positive training world that there's this this i say you do and you get 
a relationship that we have with dogs through training, obedience training, whatever you want to call it, when actually, I, I, and I've always said this, and I learned this at drama school when I was an actor, actually, uh, and, and so um, eons ago, where somebody always said, do less, do less. And I've always remembered that as an actor, do less. Because actors, and certainly um, Amdram, amateur dramatics, uh, actors that do amateur dramatics, they just do too much, which is, is not genuine. But I took the do less into my work with dogs. And to begin with, I was, I mean, I was like, okay, I'm gonna get my dogs to do 70 different things, and aren't I a great trainer? But wait a second, it's just a lot. And, the, and the, this is, it, it's great, the dogs are happy, but I'm not really giving them the chance to sort of express themselves and just be, which I feel well, like- limiting, watching, Well, you're limiting the chance. Right. They, they have got a chance. Right. But it's limiting it potentially. Exactly. So when I saw your work, I immediately was like, yes. Thank you. And, and just, I just want to say to people out there that are listening right now, this isn't snowflakey. This isn't all, you know, just, oh, kind of like, oh, it's all this, the positive crowds going like nuts again. This is really powerful stuff. And I think until you know, and until you've seen, until you've experienced it, you have no idea about just how empowering it can be. I just have to share as well. I, I can't say the person's name because I um, haven't got permission to share their name. That somebody who attended DBC sent me a photograph of their dog pre-attending your amazing conference that bring so many amazing people together in terms of audience and speakers. And she, in this picture, there was a massive swirl of hair over her dog's right hip, looked like a sort of mini whirlwind. And then she sent uh, an after picture because when I was sharing about what I've learned from dogs over 27 years in terms of how their coat will change over areas where there may be changes to the skeleton or the you know, muscles developing unevenly, often because of reduced mobility elsewhere. She took her dog to the vet and the dog is now on pain relief and having other treatments because things that I was sharing started to sort of light, light bulbs for her. And the picture of her dog on pain relief, the coat in that area is completely smooth. So it is some really simple and hugely impactful decisions we can make based on what we actually see in front of us and we often miss what's in front of us Vicky because the brain processes what's familiar and it needs to process what's familiar and not sort of pay attention to it anymore because it leaves more space for processing new information in the environment and also in many cases things like those coat changes will be gradual and we might not recognize that because we spend every day with our dogs. And I liken that to when we used to travel back and forth to Los Angeles a lot because my partner was in a well-known TV show out there and we were restoring our old house. We're still restoring it, never finishes. Mm -hmm. And you have light bulbs without lampshades and you start to not recognize that you need to get that lampshade. You forget about it because it's become familiar. But then you leave for months at a time and you come back and that naked light bulb pings sort of at your brain because it's not been so familiar. And that's why it's really good to get new eyes on your dog, film your dog or look back over photographs of your dog's history with you because postural patterns are in place from a really early age. Coat changes can be gradual. And even natural swells and curls will become more exaggerated where there's body tension, including changes to the mobility of the skin. And, and another student started to look at the way her puppy sat and recognised that the right hind was always out. And then the dog came 
on one of the in-person events as an adolescent and we noticed a change in the fluidity of that right hind leg and again she took her dog straight to the vet and there's a tiny bone chip in the knee and she has no idea when or how her dog experienced any trauma that could have resulted in that bone fragment just being there so like I say everything we could want to know about these amazing animals is there in front of us and I I almost can't I don't want to wish my life away and my years go really quickly anyway as I'm sure you do because we have yes. to live such fulfilling lives but I almost can't wait to get six months down the line because I know I'm missing so much stuff things like you know the gunk in a dog's eye if it's always in the same eye start then doing what I call track and trace and look at the mobility of that ear on that same side and the facial structures and what's happening with the dog's jowl because you start to see dogs particularly if they've got nice loose lips like the boxers and the bull breeds that the structures on one side will be much softer but they'll be almost elevated on the other side and then you track that through the body and recognize that actually one hind limb maybe there is a coat change and maybe the dog is only ever sitting on one hip and then does that explain why dogs seem to get more aroused when you turn them away from a perceived threat in the environment and we actually recognize that instead of the dog being aroused by that threat we've added more problems into that mix because we've turned them onto a joint that may be painful and at that point they can't take the treat we might have offered as a reward for turning away so I really encourage people and we'll be sharing this at DBC to consider rewarding education instead of reward-based training and you're going to take all the amazing skills that you have learned as a reward-based educator but you're going to maybe slightly change how you use those skills, how you introduce those skills, because all of that, Vicky, can be taught in the framework of free work. And like I said, that is just a natural evolution from seeing the benefits of a load of different sensory activities being made available to the dogs at the farm. And when Henry, my current companion, boinged his way through the gates for four or five years ago, he kind of brought all those elements together into one more structured approach but the dog in free work we take everything off if it's safe to do so including the collar really does have the opportunity to be the pilot of his own learning experiences mm -hmm. and it's not that we're just going do what you want dogs need to learn skills to live successfully and safely with us but every pilot needs the support of an air traffic controller and that's what our role is we're going to guide and shape and create those experiences for the dog so we can be with our dog instead of always having to do something with our dog and we're going to you know let that dog explore those different layouts which I will go through in DBC as well and maybe we will join them and be their co-pilot because obviously dogs really enjoy us being a part of their lives hopefully as much as we enjoy them being a part of ours so it's been unbelievably liberating for guardians as well and there's something magic about just letting the dogs explore and letting them explore a different range of movement as well because those movement patterns are, are quite entrenched quite early reinforced and shaped by us but they're not necessarily that beneficial to the dog you know we inadvertently reinforce the natural one-sidedness anyway and we we've had dogs who've been you know squirrel um chasers for years who will be hyper vigilant minute they're outside they're tense the tails up heads up the space of the ear the space between the ears is narrow that tells me immediately the sympathetic nervous system's engaged. Learning's not possible. The dog's more habitual, uh, more reflexive in his responses. But when these dogs come and explore free work and we start to shape the different sensory items to meet their needs, we might play with the height or the angle of it. We might not have anything that makes a noise at first. We may have firm textures underfoot if we 
start to see the dog avoids anything soft. We shape these learning experiences, Vicky, and within you know one or two sessions, and our sessions are 15, 20 minutes, the tail starts to drop in these dogs. They start to lengthen through the back. The ears start to sort of melt on the side of the dog's head. They start to take that huge breath and the whole rib cage starts to expand. And I can say, now watch when your dog goes back to his alert posture. You might only see his stomach moving when he breathes, not this beautiful in and out of that incredible rib cage, the diaphragm and everything working as nature intended. And then the guardian might float their dog back out on a line now. And I watch these partnerships just standing outside surveying 90 acres of Tilly farmland and the dog's just quietly air scenting he's not scanning he's not tense and the partnership can just be together with the guardian marveling at her the brilliance of her companion instead of trying to hold on and becoming tense and anxious her, herself or his self it's I just think it's a gift I think what you and I and anyone else out there who's part of a relationship building session in whatever way we do it is, I just think we're so blessed. It, uh, well, I don't know. I just, the, the day I don't feel like this is the day I need to say, thanks. It's been amazing. I'm retiring. Yeah. And you know, when you talk about arousal, um, you talk about dogs that are squirrel chasers where to, the dogs that you see um, maybe have some stress issues, anxiety issues, tension, uh, reactive, reactive behavior. And, and so you're not addressing it in a way of like, we're, we're going to counter condition and we're going to do this. Uh -huh. we're, we're, we're actually stripping it away. Yeah. It almost like you're stripping it away to you're unpeeling those layers. Yeah. Yeah, you really are getting to the center and yeah. the education. Yeah. To the center of that that dog. We had um an am amazing experience with some scent detection dogs, where again it goes back to that rewarding education versus reward-based training, where the handlers were rewarding the dog with balls and they weren't, you know, lobbing them great distances, but they were still throwing them far enough and fast enough to sort of switch on that arousal part of the nervous system, sympathetic nervous system to kind of simplify things. And I said, OK, let's watch what we see. And the ears were tied and the brows were furrowed on the dogs, not the people, obviously. And the eye membranes were red and the dogs were panting. And I said, don't think about the amount of energy this dog's expending. And then the dogs were coming back with like, holding onto the ball. They couldn't release them. And I said, this is not the dog trying to retain possession. The dog is now so tight and those jaw muscles are so tense that it changes our ability to grade pressure when we're aroused. It's why people get slapped really hard on the back where there's a lot of adrenaline, such as, you know, scoring a, a, a goal on a football field. You know, footballers don't go up and go, well done. They're like... So it changes everything in the body. And we need to recognize that that is what's happening in a dog that can't release something. Of course, there could be other factors. So I said, okay, I just want you as a guardian and the handlers just to start breathing and just to soften your own posture. And then when the dog is able to release the ball, who cares if it takes two seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, let's reframe this. Is the engagement enjoyable for the dog because the dog is spending time with someone meaningful or is it really in that running after the ball? And what else might be happening in the body, your micro trauma and what's going on in the brain that is going to become almost obsessive potentially for this dog? So we just started rolling the balls and the dogs were just, oh my gosh, again, like I wish we'd filmed it. But I get to have these experiences multiple times. So I'll try and remember to film it one day. The dogs were just softening. The eyes were going from red to pink. They were taking these breaths. Their ears were softening and they were dropping the balls either direct into the guardian or the handler's hand on their lap or just quietly at their feet. And the compulsive behaviors that we were starting to see or compulsive type behaviors 
because I prefer to kind of add type to lots of things so we don't label and get caught in those traps of course we need words but we can limit our own learning when we start to kind of diagnose or identify we, we don't know but we do know what we see and not only were these dogs more relaxed they were softer in the body they were more accurate in locating the scent as well because everything was just calmer and more relaxed and there was no build up of tension no excess energy that was going to limit you know how much energy reserves the dogs had to carry on working it it's those simple details and we go why didn't I think of this before and I you know I think that with free work what did I do pre-free work I had elements of it all and we would do like scent barns for dogs and then we would maybe do something different but bringing it all together in free work I'm, I'm quite aghast that it took 27 years to get there because I was seeing all those bits working mm. so that's how you know learning comes it comes in layers and we learn something and it's effective we don't necessarily think we need to look deeper but we do so for people listening or people that are going to attend the conference um what what if they go well all right sarah that's all very well but i want to play games with my dog i want to train my dogs to do stuff i want to do sports with my dog i want to take my dog out and go running with them what do you say to that 100% you know your dog better than anyone what free work can do is to be adapted to whatever your favorite interactions are but to also encourage you to keep a question mark over what your dog finds rewarding versus what he's doing in order to get the food or to be with you and I think we need to be really careful as reward-based educators because actually we can create conflict and make that engagement not as rewarding for the dog as perhaps we hoped it might be. And in free work, we use it as a warm up and a cool down. We use it to help the dog strengthen so that he, because he's moving more efficiently, it can help guardians identify or caregivers where that dog might need additional support from a vet and then maybe a physical therapist or maybe some acupuncture, pain relief is the big one. Um, or, or maybe support for anxiety, but anxiety and body sensitivity often go hand in hand. So it's, it helps us kind of unpick some of those threads. And you might actually recognize more subtle levels of communication about what your dog really does enjoy. And it also helps you kind of reframe your thinking about some of the words you might be using yourself, because positive words are equally problematic, in my humble opinion. So in, in free work, for example, we always put the dog's toys. We have water available. People are stunned to see how much their dog needs to drink when they're learning new skills or they're stunned to see that their dog can drink away from home in a free work setting because it's something that has always been quite challenging for the caregiver if they knew they were going to be away from home overnight. So people start to see their dogs with new eyes because the dogs are also showing different behavior. We had one dog who the guardian said, oh, my dog loves a ball, always carries a ball. It's really meaningful. So you 100% must have that in free work. And also we can have some other toys. So the dog's always got choice. And we set up all these sensory things like raised snuffle mats. And I create kind of what I call a country walk, which I'll, I'll, I'll share in DBC as well. And this dog ignored the ball, knew it was there. Kind of did the fly past quick air scent. And the guardian was saying, but my dog's not picking up the ball. I said, because, you know, maybe we're meeting other needs. We're engaging all the eight senses not just, you know, satisfying some needs through games. It's really, un, it's not uncommon that dogs do not react with the toys or behave in the way the Guardian's ex- expecting. This is, you know, n- not an uncommon thing we're witnessing. The dog was just enjoying exploring. And there's strong evidence, too, that to show that learning's actually accelerated through free work. Um, 
there's growing evidence for that. This dog was just relaxing and settling more and lengthening through the body, as we see. And then there was a big um, clap of uh, sort of a bang as the wind got up and a piece of wooden cladding hit the side of the barn where we were. And it was at that moment, Vicky, that the dog ran and grabbed the ball mm. and then stopped and dropped the ball, shook off, took the breath, went back to exploring the free work. The Guardian, I could see her thinking deeply about what she just witnessed and she said do you know what she said um now I'm asking if my dog does love a ball or whether my dog needs the ball because the dog's actually not comfortable in the environments I take my dog to I said fantastic thinking how do we know you know because you're going to start watching and we've had the same where dogs when people reached out to touch them had to disengage and go and pick something up in free work and then come back but just stand next to their guardian. But when we were able to teach more mindful contact and invite the dog to give information to the guardian of when body contact was appropriate and when the dog needed that to stop, they didn't need to go and pick up something and hold it in their mouth again. Mm. It really is, for me, a way of having a really deep conversation Absolutely. with these incredible guardians who bless us with far more we could ever hope to give them yeah i mean i, I agree with that i 100 percent agree with that um you have courses that people can take now can you tell me a little bit about that we do have a variety of courses on online but also online and in person and if people can't obviously come to the farm if they're abroad or um, still can't travel for any reason then we we add on for the longer courses additional support online and with a one-to-one -one with an ace instructor who obviously is able to then help identify these small shifts in the nervous system look at the way the dog's organizing his body in walk how the dog's respiration system is changing in response to whatever's going on in the dog's internal environment. So the whole premise of ACE really is to consider rewarding education versus reward-based training, but also to help guardians and caregivers be more aware of and pay more attention to the dog's internal environment. So the courses go through observations and all these details that I've been sharing and how to set up free work to meet that individual dog's needs to support that internal environment. And the more balanced that internal environment is, Vicky, the less disruptive that external environment will be, regardless of what that external environment is. It is, it really is almost not a complete 180, but for everyone who sort of thinks, oh, I'm a reward based trainer and you know uh, that it's a, it is an even more different way to look it's more layers it, it is more layers adding more layers yeah and i and i and i think that's what's so exciting about it um you know we've had you speak at the conference every year uh, every year uh, people you. love you and that's why we keep having you back um, my highlight too thank you <laughs> um but 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 it's also really been interesting on how you have changed throughout the the years like we all do and and i yeah. think that for for people who are maybe just starting out as trainers that um you're always going to learn you are always going to to transition change something new see something new develop something new learn about new things and what you did five years ago, you might do something completely different yeah. now. I, and I think the beauty of it is to be open. Absolutely. And, and also to know you are going to make mistakes. And I yeah. write those M-I-S-S, T-A-K-E-S. -S. You're going to make mistakes because you're going to miss stuff. You're going to miss stuff because it's familiar. You're going to miss stuff because it's unfamiliar, because you're thinking of something else or you've got a more pressing need to support the dog in a very specific area of his life you're going to miss something and like I said I almost can't wait for the next six months next 12 months because I will have learned so much more 
And I, I look back at photographs and videos and words I've written and I just think, oh gosh, did I, how did I not connect that? How did I miss that? How did I not see that when I've watched it, you know, that video mm -hmm. 20, 30, 40, 100 times? But living with dogs and, and other aspects of life to me is like watching your favourite film over and over. You will hear more nuance in that dialogue. You will see scenes that you would swear you've never watched before because there would have been other scenes that were more relevant and therefore more memorable. And also what's really interesting, Vicky, is your brain is basing what it's seeing on information that's kind of already been banked in a simplistic way. So we can read a text from someone, we can look at a photograph and our brain is almost telling us what to expect. So sometimes we actually misread detail that's there in front of us in black and white. So of course we're gonna miss detail in this amazing being who has our you know, heart and soul, but is filtering and processing information every day mm. and therefore potentially changing every day. Mm. But we we miss it because our brains have gone, this is my companion, and we haven't learned the skill and the joy and the relevance of just looking a little deeper. And I do think because we lead busy lives, because we're always going on to the next thing. I mean, I think I know with it, just, just talking uh, personally about myself, that I'm always sort of thinking about tomorrow and thinking about what I've got to do, and then I've got this deadline, and I've got, that, that I actually miss being, well, I, I am literally miss being present. I am yeah. not present, and I, and I do think it is this whole mindfulness thing that, that actually that is part of it, where you allow yourself yes. to be, just present uh i have this thing where i feel guilty when i just lie on the sofa and read a book i have to learn to allow myself give yourself permission yeah i can do that it's okay that the, the the deadlines will wait it's okay yeah um and i think that that really understanding being more present and and when you are more present and you are looking at your dog in situ at that moment and you're really focusing on it you are going to find out information that you've never seen before and i think that's the beauty of it and that's what i'm so excited for you to be giving that information out um to people that attend the dbc well i just you know i, I i'm so grateful to to you for inviting me year after year because it is the most amazing opportunity to share my passion. And each year there has been quite significant evolution, hopefully. And one thing that I ask or encourage my A students to do is to just sit and watch your dog sleeping. Because how often do we just sit and be with our dog? We're normally reading a book, catching up, looking at the phone, maybe flipping the TV channel. Do we actually take the time? to recognize our dog's baseline, B-A-C-E, of course I can slot ACE in everywhere, <laughs> and recognize their breath rate when they're relaxing, that yeah. rise and fall of that incredible rib cage when they're snoozing by our side, but also watch them dream, mm. because it's amazing watching dogs twitch when they're in deep sleep, and do you start to recognize dog? Actually never does go into that deep rest sleep cycle. Yeah. And Henry's, my companion, is amazing because in his sleep, when he's dreaming, his right ear doesn't move as much as his left, which is what happens when he's awake. So the, the internal environment of the dog is going to be quite similar in rest, but hopefully more relaxed than um, quite similar to the way that internal environment is when that dog's awake and upright and moving perhaps so again we can start practice our observation saying i've noticed my dog's right paw flicks in dream but his left paw isn't and actually when i start watching him walk i actually do see a twist in the body and a slight unlevelness in that walk i think i need to take my dog for a vet check 
but it's just also that art of just being with our dog and recognizing how we feel in our internal environment when we're with our dogs because for for some guardians many guardians it can be really challenging to manage some of the behaviors that they're observing in their dogs because it is filling them with anxiety or dread or they're feeling judged or judged by other family family members so how, how can you find your baseline and if we don't know our dog's baseline and our baseline we don't have the ability to recognize internally when that's starting to change right and i think that's 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 the key isn't it yeah it's 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 recognizing as, as you said that baseline and seeing changes to it no. or is that does that mean something i mean uh, going back to what you had spoken to uh, about in the beginning about coat change yeah. um, after learning with you i started to see that in my elderly labrador there was a definite uh, coat change at the base of her tail and the well hair done. began to stick up and it starts to get very dry. Ooh, I thought, ooh, took her to the vet, of course, starting of arthritis. And, and there was that painful area. As soon as we had our own pain meds, as soon as we, you know, we started to do all kinds of therapy with her, the coat, you know, it wasn't dry anymore. Um, the coat wasn't sticking up. It was so, so I really identify with um, that person who, who said about the swirl and, and again, you know, uh, I have elderly dogs now, um, and they are both have therapy because I think it's really important therapy and pain management for their for their arthritis. And um, but but you're also working with all ages from puppies yeah. up to the elderly, and so it's not just sort of an elderly dogs thing. You're you're no, you're, it's not. You're talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, lots dogs of young dogs age. have got undiagnosed pain. Lots of young dogs get arthritis. Yeah. It isn't yeah. a disease that only comes with old age, far from it. And again, when we slow movement down, all these things become more evident. And one of their you know, favorite sayings in ACE is busy brain or body pain, because mm -hmm. lots of active dogs actually have undiagnosed pain because mm -hmm. pain keeps the sympathetic nervous system switched on. Mm -hmm. And obviously people know how I work, but I can hand on heart say every dog that show dog reactivity that's come to my farm has had elbow dysplasia, luxating patella or hip dysplasia or lumbar sacral disease or narrowing of their intervertebral space in the spine because the guardians have been able to see the postures. They've gone back to their vet leaving me and then ask for obviously vet exams, x-rays, whatever the vet recommends, every single case. I'm not saying it's the only reason why dogs right. become sensitive to other dogs in their environment, far from it. But underlying pain exaggerates and exacerbates so many common behavioral struggles that the domestic dog has. And we miss, it. we miss it. Yeah, we miss it. And, and, and I want to end with this because this is where you helped when I was working with um, police canine over here mm -hmm. in the States. Do you remember? Yeah, um, I do. There was a young dog, uh, a young hand learner's dog, and uh, he was concerned and the dog lived in the house, right? It wasn't just an outside dog, um, uh, you know, but he was concerned that now he was starting to touch his dog and his dog was growling at him. And his dog has growled at his wife. And, and I was like, mm, I think you need to go and get some. This sounds like a little touch sensitivity. I don't, I think you need to go to your vet. Well, the vet's given a clean bill of health. I was like, no, get an x-ray done. Or, um, and get and video. I want you to video the dog walking away. I want you to video the dog walking back. I'm gonna send it to Sarah Fisher. And I know that you had said, look, just take a look at this and I see this and that. Well, I'm telling you, once that dog was put on pain medication, it took a couple of weeks. Yeah. The growling stopped. The touch sensitivity that it stopped. Yeah. Amazing. You're amazing. No, you're amazing because I was like, you're amazing. She's going to she's going to deal with this. And so when we're talking about companion dogs and working dogs and again, how important it is that we we don't mistake stuff. Yeah. Um, so, oh, my gosh. 
there is going to be more and i know that you're going to unlock some of those incredible secrets yeah. of the dog behavior conference sarah fisher you are amazing you are Thank truly you amazing you. and um yeah for everybody who hasn't registered yet it is dogbehaviorconference.com go and register please 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 three days of amazing information from a, a lot of incredible people including sarah fisher it's going to blow your mind and uh it's i love the dbc because it's sort of an intimate atmosphere everyone is in the same room together um and of course if you can't be there live don't worry about it if you register you will have access to all the presentations after the presentations have come out um live so to speak for the next 12 months so um yeah but can't wait to see you there sarah and i can't wait for people to hear what you have to say thank you all I'm right take care Bye. Bye.